Today we're in Acts chapter 20, beginning with verse 7. On the first day of the week, when we met to break bread, Paul was holding a discussion with them. These are disciples of Jesus. He intended to leave the next day. He continued speaking until midnight. There were many lamps in the room upstairs where they were meeting, and a young man named Eutychus, who was sitting in the window, began to sink off deep into sleep while Paul talked still longer. No remarks on long sermons right now. We're reading scripture. I hear your giggles. Paul talked still longer. Overcome by sleep, he, Eutychus, fell to the ground three stories below and was picked up dead. But Paul went down, bending over him, took him in his arms and said, don't be alarmed, there's life in him. Then Paul went upstairs and after he'd broken bread and eaten, he continued to converse with them until dawn and then he left. Meanwhile, they had taken the boy away alive and were not a little comforted. The word of God. You can be seated. The word of God, and that's the end of a very short story. There's no moralizing. There's no take-home point. There's no big theological truth. The story is simply over. They don't even create, actually, a safety policy. Wouldn't you expect that would come next? You know how safety policies are created. Kids fall out of windows. Do you know why we don't have a lot of lit candles in the church anymore? Because once upon a time, a candle table burned up in front of our eyes over Easter weekend while Elder Maury Jackson was preaching a homily and we caught on fire in the church. It was a rousing homily, we say. This is why we don't have a lot of open flames. A safety protocol policy was made, but not in our story today. You would think someone would say, minors cannot sit on window seals or please lock all the windows, but that's not what happens. The specialists who study scripture, and particularly the book of Acts, they have a one-line summary for our story today that sounds like this. This story, it's a serious and comedic episode. The end. It's kind of like saying, well, that happened. And then Paul moved on. So why is the story of Eutychus in our Bibles? What can the story of Eutychus mean for us today? Luke is a great storyteller, by the way. He gives us enough detail to draw us in, but he's ambiguous enough to make us scratch our heads. There is another tale the people of the time in the Bible might have known, a Homeric table of a boy who fell from the top of a roof and a conversation about what to do with him when they pick him up at the bottom. The first century listeners would maybe have that story in mind. We don't today. What is the story of Eutychus for in the Bible, and why is Luke so careful the way he tells the story? Don't miss that in the Bible, stories are told certain ways. Storytellers have some privilege. We had some fun on Wednesday night with Pastor Ben and Calmany because the youth uh, get to know you session asked Ben and Calmany from Canada, tell us how you met one another. By the way, they've just celebrated their first anniversary, first year anniversary, so happy anniversary last Sabbath. But if you can look in close to this picture, there's a moment here where they, they're thinking about the question they've just been asked. Tell us how you met. And for a moment, the two of them look at each other and the mic goes back and forth and they look to the side. I'm standing in the back of the room going, look at they're comparing notes right now. They're trying to decide how to tell the story. What's the story they should tell? What's the story we get to hear? What's the kosher version for all the youth? Like all that went down in front of our eyes. Next picture, Nathan. They got their story together. Look at the smiles. They're having so much fun. They know their story. They know the story they wanted us to hear. Once upon a time, they went to summer camp and they might have been dating other people and they might have left as a couple. You got company in this church, by the way. Because they can tell the story the way they want to tell the story. That's what's going on in the book of Acts. Luke is an exceptional storyteller. When he's ambiguous, we better leave room for ambiguity. And when he's clear, we ought to be clear. We've talked about this all summer. What shall we do with Eutychus in our Bibles? The first followers of Jesus, they're gathered in this room. By the way, welcome Vacation Bible School families, parents, children. You may be a guest for the first time this morning. Welcome. 
If you're watching online and this is your first time to be with our community, all summer long we've had the book of Acts open. All summer long we're asking questions of this group of people who somehow coalesce and they all decide to walk the same direction with Jesus under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Last week we were in chapter 10 with Pastor Jason where we learned the Spirit will surprise us and we cannot manage surprise. It happens. This week we jumped ahead though to Acts 20 because Eutychus, there's a story with a teenager and well, that seemed right for Vacation Bible School Week. So we're in chapter 20, it's a simple scene. Paul is on his way home from Jerusalem and he stopped overnight with this group of people in the upper room. This is, uh, they've heard him preach before, but this is the last time they'll be face to face with the Apostle Paul. It hasn't gone so well on his journey, so his kind of fearless, uh, adventurous journey is coming to an end. He's on his way back home. He's undercover a little bit in Troas, modern day Turkey, when they meet in the upper room. He cut the trip short because truthfully, the people who claim to know God are not acting like they know God. And the people who might need to know God are busy worshiping and obeying Rome. There have been riots in the street and death threats against Paul's life, and so he's decided it's time to pack up and go home. This is when we find them gathered in the upper room on this night, a group of people who probably already know the message of Jesus. In the scene, it's supper time. Maybe it's seven o'clock, maybe it's eight o'clock. We should imagine the table is spread with the food, whatever the meal is. They are hungry. The apostle Paul starts talking, and he goes on, and he goes on, and I don't know how long is a long sermon for you. My husband says 10 minutes is enough. He says it to me regularly. If you can't say it in 10 minutes, you should write it again. (laughs) And he listens for the full 20 or 30. How long is a long sermon? The Apostle Paul goes on and on. Maybe it's four hours, maybe it's six hours. Come on, Paul, we want to hear about the time. Tell us about the snake bite and tell us about the shipwreck. And even if you're a great storyteller, six hours of stories is a lot. People get exhausted. Even if they are theological truths, 28 fundamental beliefs is a lot. People get tired. So there are some in the room who grow exhausted. In Acts 9a, a young man named Eutychus who was sitting in the window began to sink off into the deep sleep while Paul still talked longer. This is not nodding off, it's a deep sleep, it's the snoring kind. My father used to scribble notes during church so he would not snore when he fell asleep. My mother finally realized if he writes postcards during the sermon, he won't snore. This is a deep nodding off kind of sleep that happens to this teenager. Of course he's sitting in the window because that's where the risk is. Of course he's sitting in the window because the room is Lit, the Bible says lit. I don't know why we need to know. It's lots of lamps, but the window is fresh air. Of course he's sitting in the window because that's where the adults are not. He's a teenager after all. This is a generational story. This is one way we tell the story of Eutychus. Here's another. This is a salvation story. Wake up, church. Wake up, one day we will stand with our Redeemer and our Savior and we will give explanation for our sleepy and kind of, you know, somber lives. One day we will wake up, youth and young adults, and we will give an account. Oh, wake up, church. And we use the word apathy. And for generations, we've talked about this as a salvation story. That's one way to hear the story. Here's another. This is a resurrection story. Can Paul heal like Jesus healed? Because he hasn't yet. We had a resurrection story a couple of weeks ago with Dorcas, Tabitha, correct? Only if we read carefully back up to verse 10, when, when Paul goes down and scoops up the boy, the storyteller says, don't be alarmed, there's still life in him. So he's not dead. There's still life in him. And then Paul goes back up. When the storyteller is ambiguous, we have to leave room for that. When the storyteller is clear, we leave room for that as well. I I don't think that this is a resurrection story primarily. What if it is a story of a grand adventure 
of lack of awareness. What if this is the night the adults in the room forgot they were the adults in the room? What if supper is on the table and Paul is going on a little long and six hours in and some are eager and some are exhausted and the people grow exhausted and they can't do more. Some biblical specialists say of this scene right now, well, there was so much good news. Paul had to keep talking. The love of God, you can't exhaust that topic. I agree. I think it's the theme of the entire Bible, the great love of God. We can't exhaust that topic. And also, the Apostle Paul is human. There's a lot of chatter to share that night. Things happened on his trip. There were betrayals, right? There were riots, right? There were lies, correct? On the trip, there was much to share, much chatter, maybe gossip, there was anger, maybe there's hate. The family of Jesus, they're not all on the same page that night in the upper room when Eutychus falls asleep and out the window. So it could have turned into a gripe session, church, just as easily as anything else. It could have turned into a gripe session that night with the body of Christ. Think about it. What did the kids hear in the room that night? What did the adults say? Maybe this is the night the adults forgot they were the adults in the room. I want to think about that this morning. Why do we allow people to sit on the margins, by the way? Why do we allow people to sit over there in the window seal? Why do we lose track of people? Why do we not notice he's sleepy, she's distracted? They're about to fall out of the community. Why do I allow that to happen? Is it really because it's an awkward, I, I, awkward, I, I really don't have confidence in how to engage, so I'm gonna pretend they're not on the ledge about to fall out. Why do we allow this to happen? Paul's excessive talkingness is an attentive inattentiveness. It's an inattentiveness to what's happening in the room this day. And his excessive talking has an outcome. There's a consequence to this. There's a younger person in the room not able to take it all in, sitting in a dangerous location. We've been listening to Willie James Jennings off and on through this series, his commentary on the book of Acts, which I've very much enjoyed. Jennings says of this scene, we who speak of the saving love of God are not mindful of the bodies that listen and the dangerous positions they are in as they listen. Nor do we consider the danger we put them in by placing the weight of our words on young bodies. What is the effect of our words on the ears of the young? Think about this. What is the effect of our words on the young? From the earliest times of Jesus, people are gathering, but what they're not doing well is community. <laughs> so if they have a challenge with awareness and intentionality, it's likely we will too, we do too. A great adventure in a lack of awareness. For me, perhaps the most unsettling part of Acts chapter 20 is after Paul goes down into the street, he sees that the boy is not completely dead. Oh, there's still life in him. The storyteller says he goes back upstairs. Don't be alarmed. He goes back upstairs after they broke bread, they ate. He continued to talk all night long until morning. Because a kid falling out of the window wasn't enough of a sign. <laughs> well, he's not dead. We can keep talking. Church, the love of God can keep us up all night but it also ought to keep us attentive to one another. Some of you were here a few years ago when we had an emergency right here in the front rows, row two, three, four, a medical emergency. And worship was happening, and it was about time for the sermon and the scripture reading, and people were moving. The emergency professionals did exactly what they're trained to do, and assessing was going on, and 911 was called, and one of our church members was laid down on the floor, the pew, and I think then the floor, and then carefully deciding, can we transport this person out of the sanctuary? And all of the rest of us are here in the church going, what do we do now? <laughs> I know one thing we did, we stopped talking, and we attend. 
as awkward as it is. It's happened more than once in this sanctuary over the years. I remember an incident back there. I remember several in the back. What do we do? We stop talking and we start attending. In Acts chapter 20, this is part of the problem that they're having. They, they can't stop talking. It turns out that sermons don't heal the sick. Sermons don't wake the sleepy. Sermons rarely inspire the community. I'm telling you the truth this morning. Spirit, sermons rarely rally the community. Locking all the windows doesn't actually keep people safe. Fundamental beliefs, important as they are, don't usually energize the people, but communities do. Acts 20 is a community of people, and gossip and negativity and baggage never creates joy in a community. Communities with an intention can attend to this. What happens when the adults in the room are the adults in the room? I've always appreciated Pastor Beverly Maravia's excising judgment when it comes to our children from the very first day, but it has sharpened in her 10 years with us here. Pastor Bev has cautioned us time and time again, don't give children bad news that doesn't belong to them. Don't give children baggage that's not of their generation. Don't give children uh, things they can't possibly hear and comprehend and don't know what to do with and that they cannot unhear. And please don't teach them poorly of God. We only have to fix that later. My favorite moments with our kids in La Sierra over the years are when our kids tell us what they know. We have sharp kids in this community. My favorite stories are when the kids say, you know, our, when our parents don't want us to know what they're talking about, they whisper and they spell things, but we spell too, Pastor Chris. <laughs> they think we don't spell, but we spell. Our kids know things. These are my favorite moments listening to them over the years. Eutychus, whose name means fortunate, he does not die this night in the story. There is life in him. It is easy for me, by the way, to critique these stories in scripture. It is more work to think creatively about better outcomes. It's easy to find the bad news. It takes more patience to wait for the good news. So here's some understated good news. Here's the moment in the story when the Apostle Paul runs down into the street and finds this boy. The text says he went down and fell on him. It's one word, a verb. He fell on him. He hurled himself at him. He threw his body down. He embraced him. It's not what kind of proper people do. He threw his own tor his whole torso on the boy and pulled him close. It's a great word in the New Testament. We only see this verb used this way one other time. Can you imagine a scene you might know in the Bible in the, Old, in the New Testament where someone hurls themselves at someone else? Luke chapter 15, the prodigal son story. Look at this text from Luke chapter 15, about verse 20. This is when the younger brother is coming back home after squandering everything that the father has given him. So the younger son set off and went to find his father. While he was still far off, the father saw him and was filled with compassion, and he ran and did what? Put his arms, he hurled himself, he threw himself on the body of his son. We know this story. The next thing that happened is the father calls for the best robe and the best sandals and the best impossible burger from the fields. And they throw a party because the son who was lost, who was almost dead, is home. The, the community hurled themselves at this boy. In both of these stories, Eutychus and the prodigal son, there's no lingering around finding fault or assigning blame. Oh, we could do that. Parents squander by giving things away. Children waste. Sermons, preachers get preachy. Teenagers get bored. But in these two stories in the Bible, there's no time to sit around and assign blame and, and to point fingers. Well, this one was indulgent. Well, that one was wayward. Well, this one was apathetic. Well, this one was self-righteous. There is no time for that in these stories. 
They simply throw themselves on the body because being found and pulled forward, being found and pulled into the circle of grace, being almost dead and now alive, this is the only possible response. This is the beauty of these stories. In one word, we get all of that, church. Luke, I think, is deliberately pointing us to the prodigal son. He hopes we'll catch that part of the story when we read the Eutychus story the night the adults forgot they were the adults in the room. But in one action, the apostle Paul brought the boy home. We're asking in this series over the summer, what shall we do with this intersection post-pandemic as we're coming out and coming alive, the facility this week full of activity? What shall we intentionally do with this post-pandemic intersection? Oh, there's, they, we know the what and the why of how, we know the what and the how to gather. We wake up on Sabbath and put on our clothes and show up here and we sing some songs and that's the what we do. Why do we do it? We've been asking the question when we know the why, that will bring us into sharper focus post-pandemic. Why do we gather? Why do we do what we do? It's time for us to this part of the series in the next few weeks to, to, to bring that question into focus and start making our lists, church. Some of what, why we do what we do is very, very simple. Watching people come out out of shelter at home these long, long months, watching people come alive again, that's been interesting. And for some people, it's been it incited some decisions and some fresh decisions for families and for businesses. I was traveling a couple of weeks ago up in Northern California, wandering in a little tiny town, Nevada, where I picked up a newspaper and read that the city council had decided we will close our streets from 5 to 8 p.m. now in the evenings because we kind of liked what it felt like when we were all out in the streets. We kind of like this. The cafes move the tables out in the street and the music happens and the children run and play and the community's pushing back a little and they're trying to figure out this is downtown Novato where they're serving Martinelli's. I ate a little ways down the street here. These streets are now closed from 5 to 8 p.m. Friday through Sunday so the people can be outside and in the streets because we learned people need people. Pandemic taught us that. That's the why they're doing this. We need one another. There's a word for this. The New York Times columnist Adam Grant wrote about it this week. Maybe you read the same opinion column. He calls it collective effervescence. Isn't that a great word? Collective effervescence. It's a sense of energy and harmony and joy around a shared purpose. It turns out when they study humans, most of us have these experiences of collective effervescence at least daily, and it happens with strangers very often. Those of us who live alone, it happens less frequently, but what we learned is that we don't do well without collective effervescence. We need to be with other people. We need the energy and the harmony and the joy that hap It happens, by the way, when your colleagues gather around the table. The pastors are so happy to get to see each other again and be in a room and do our work. That's collective effervescence. It happens when a family or a group of cousins comes to worship and sits together. At last, we're together. It happens when people get on a ball field and play a game. It happens when people go onto the dance floor. Even with strangers, there's a collective sense of energy and harmony, and it turns out people need this, and the body of Christ needs it too. Your church was full of collective effervescence this week. If you saw the Vacation Bible School video at the beginning, you felt the collective energy and the harmony. This is exactly what we were doing this week. We needed to be together, and, and it turns out when we gathered, this collective effervescence bubbled over in some of us. There were so many greetings. Oh, I haven't seen you for a year or more. Oh, you used to be this tall, you have beard on your face. <laughs> Oh, I mean, it came out with a little boy driving by the church, a little girl, I think Pastor Bev told me, saw all the activity, told her mother, stop the car, turn around, we're going there. They're doing something. That's collective effervescence, church. It happened when a mom said to me, I'm, I'm standing here watching my boys have so much fun, I think I'm gonna cry, Pastor, I'm gonna cry. Collective effervescence. 
Turns out the body of Christ needs it. My theory is we need it for its sake alone and because of what it does for us. It grows muscles and flexibility in us so that when we have to do hard things, we can do hard things together because we have that shared experience of a harmony and energy. When we have to do hard things, we will. It is time for the Church of Jesus to do hard things in the world, and I wonder post-pandemic if we'll be ready for this, if we will find our voice that sounds a little more like Jesus and can be hopeful and helpful in the world. Maybe you were like me on Sunday watching the final in the Euro Cup, right, as the team from England and the team from Italy went all the way to the penalty match. What a tragic way to have to win or lose a game if you've been more than 50 years just trying to get into the playoffs. This is from my good friend and colleague, Pastor Devo and Pastor Otis, the two who like to talk football and soccer. But on Sunday, I was like everyone else watching, and when I saw these young players, 23, 22, 19, getting up to take their penalty kicks, my stomach said, this is, this is not gonna end well. I'm looking at these young guys on the screen. This is not gonna end well. Not that I know anything about their skill, I had a sense. And it only took minutes. It only took minutes, and maybe you've been following it this week. Oh, it's not because they were young, it's because they are what? In the United States, we have no credibility to weigh in on a topic of racism in another country. We have our own healing and our own work to do. We have our own trauma to heal. But somehow the people of Jesus have got to find our voice and our hope in the world on big topics of hatred. I hope post-pandemic we are getting ready for that. This fall, we're going to study this topic with some help from the university and a visiting scholar from, from Howard University in the History and Sociology Department. This fall, we hope you're here, September, October, November, we're gonna open the Bible and look at racial reconciliation and wonder how did Christians get so far off track and where do we find our hope? Collective effervescence in the moment and also it gives us muscle and flexibility and strength to do the hard things together, church. Turns out we need that. Several of us went last Sabbath afternoon with the mayor to a Ward 7 meeting just up the street. Thank you, about 20 of us who took this as Sabbath activity and assignment. And we listened as the mayor wanted to kind of talk about her ideas and the direction and the vision of the church, a series of big tent meetings that will happen over the next six, eight, 10 months. She was here in our church, at, uh, most of worship actually, all of Pastor Jason's sermons. She was so touched by the music and the presence and she said to us after worship, I hope the meeting we're going to, we, we will understand a little of what Pastor Jason was talking about, the, the making categories of people and othering people and making it ugly and difficult. And it turns out last Sabbath afternoon, that's exactly what happened. It was not a high point for Ward 7 in the city of Riverside. Those of us who were present were a little shocked, some of us. One topic homelessness and mental health and the horrible streets and why isn't the city and it was just one ugly comment after one ugly comment after one ugly comment. I wanna tell you when the room turned hopeful was when the two 20 year old guys stood up. Townsend was his name. Townsend says, so I grew up in this neighborhood, I grew up in Riverside and yeah, my life was about gangs and drugs, I'm not gonna lie and I lived on the streets. And so when you're talking about mental health and homelessness, yeah, I, I just wanna tell you it's difficult life. And, and I'm, I met Jesus in jail and he had a Bible in his hands. And I, I just wanted you to know me. And Townsend sat down and another one stood up. His name was Jonathan. And Jonathan said, yeah, I uh, also grew up um, here, moved here from Orange County. My, my mother had me, and then my father left, and then my father came home long enough to get her pregnant, and then he left, and now my mom, a single mom, has more kids to raise, and yeah, I grew up on the streets of Riverside and in Juvenile Hall, and, on, and, on, and so when you're talking about people who live on the streets, I, I just 
these poor, these poor guys in a toxic room, I'm going to tell you, in our neighborhood. Complex, complex conversations. Two brave guys. Jonathan says, so when you talk about mental health and homelessness and all, you know, all the things, maybe you can just be a, a little kind. One woman turned to him and said, what can we do to be helpful? Don't you love it when someone asks that question? What can we do to be helpful because this is our neighborhood and we're in this together? How could we be helpful? And the answer to the question, well, love, love and a lot, a lot of grace would sure help. And as soon as that was said, you could hear the room murmur and I could see the head shaking. A woman next to me got up and left the room. People are just not having it. It was a low moment in Ward 7. Don't ask people what they need if we're not going to listen. Yes. It would have been better if we hadn't asked. But when I followed Townsend and Jonathan out to the parking lot, I almost had to chase them down carrying their Bibles. Brave guys that day walking in. They're 20 something, but they wear, wear 60 and 70 years of living on their bodies. And when I listened to their stories, I said, There's a church on the corner right here in Ward 7. One day we hope you'll open the doors and walk in. It's okay if we make mistakes. We just can't leave it there. It's okay if we get things wrong. We just can't leave things wrong. I am so hopeful about the possibility of the church post-pandemic. I'm so hopeful about what it could mean for us when we open the Bible and we have the book of Acts open and we begin to make our list, what are our priorities? What ought we do knowing what our why is our why? Jesus is Lord and it changes everything. Now what ought we be about in our city? I want to tell you this week that the central truths taught at Vacation Bible School are the central truths of the gospel and it never gets more simple than what we teach five-year-olds. Here's the list of what the kids learned this week, Monday through Friday. God knows you. God hears you. God comforts you, God forgives you, God chooses you, which means God treasures you, which is why all the green t-shirts say God treasures you and God hopes you will treasure one another. The end. It never gets more difficult or simple all at the same time than what we teach five-year-olds. This week, church family, we saw that the adults in the room were the teenagers of our community. You can be so content and a little bit proud of the teenagers around here. They were the adults in the room. They sign a covenant to volunteer, and as I close this morning, I'm, I'm only going to read you three or four of the covenants. They, they sign a longer list to give you a flavor of what we ask of them, to give you a flavor of the intentionality, to give you a flavor of the awareness Pastor Bev and the team are working with. Here's a couple of the covenants. Number one, I will show up ready to work in full uniform as asked of me because I recognize that this communicates to families and my colleagues that I am a part of a big team that works together. Teenagers are asked to agree to this. Here's another one. I will be on time each night because I recognize this signals to the children attending and to their families that I care about them. And I'm eager to participate as their mentor. It also lets my team know I'm here to do the work alongside them. Here's another one. I understand that coming ready to work includes a positive attitude as well as being ready to give my undivided attention to the evening program. This means I will leave my cell phone home. There's a groan in the room when the teenagers read this one. Come on, how many of the adults want to leave their phones home? Do you see the intentionality here? This one is my favorite. I will respect all children as whole persons by not talking down to them or talking over them. I covenant to be a mentor who is present among children and to model to them the best way to relate to others through kind words and actions. It was almost impossible for anyone to fall out a window during vacation Bible school. 
because look at that awareness and intentionality, church. That kind of an awareness and intentionality meant all the collective effervescence could happen. And when I met Felipe, a five-year-old on Wednesday night, he came into my space and looked up at me and said, you're at my church. This is my church. He was a little bit angry, like, uh, but full of his mama and grandma were like, do, do you know who she is? <laughs> But he doesn't care, Felipe says to me, this is my church. And every time he drives by, my church. Absolutely what we want these kids to say. Thank you, the community this week that rallied, adults, teenagers, Pastor Bev and the team, Emily, Amelie, Alexandra, Andrea in particular. Thank you that you were on duty and on watch. No one, we didn't have to worry about anyone falling out the window. Kids could simply go home and shout. Like this, this is Sophie Rodriguez. Sophia Rodriguez, listen to this. After one night of vacation Bible school, two and a half. What is it? God knows you. And if you are two and a half, that's the only thing you should have to care about, right? Oh, thank you, La Sierra, for being an aware church this week. May we commit to even deeper and deeper awareness in these next years. Amen.